morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you. Happy Monday. Happy Memorial Day. Yes, if you wouldn't mind, please go ahead and type your first name or your nickname into the chat for me. Thank you very much. So it's a bit rainy here right now, but we're told it might get a little sunny later on. We have quite a bit of rain in Hillsborough at least uh, this weekend, but we need it. We need it badly. The flowers are happy. All right, we're just at nine o'clock, so we'll let folks come in. So we're officially through our first week of class. Um, and everybody came through with flying colors. Um, everybody did their work, submitted their quizzes. Um, I got surveys, um, wonderful. Um, and lab homework as well, um, which was due last night at midnight. Um, yes, Jen, my garden is much happier now. I had been carrying some water out to the little tender plants as they were coming up because it's been so dry. So I'm so thrilled that we got a nice soaking rain for a couple of days, although it was pretty chilly. <laughs> and I was too stubborn to uh, turn the heat back on. So we were walking around in sweatshirts and jeans all weekend. All right. So this week, hard to imagine, but you're going to be taking your first lecture exam on Wednesday. So the first lecture exam covers three topics, the two that you watched and um, took notes on last week, which were the introduction to the microbes lecture topic and the history of microbiology and a little bit about microscopy topic. And then this week, the cell. So because you have that lecture exam on Wednesday, you have to get your last lecture topic viewed and your notes taken pretty quickly. You need to watch that lecture today or perhaps tomorrow um, and get the quiz submitted by midnight tomorrow. So midnight on Tuesday, which is an unusual time for us. Normally lecture quizzes will be due on Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, the lecture exam is um, an 80 point exam. So one of the first things I always tell students is don't be shocked when the computer grades the questions and you get a score that doesn't seem high to you. <laughs> I always get, there's always a student who has a terrible shock when they see, you know, like a, I don't know, a 65 on the first exam because they forgot that it's out of 80 points, not out of 100 points. Um, so don't be surprised about that. Um, and remember that on these lecture exams, there may be some short answer questions that I'm going to be grading by hand. So yes, Canvas will grade multiple choice questions immediately for you, but you won't have your complete score until I hand grade the short answer questions. So most of the questions on lecture exams are the uh, multiple choice variety, similar to what you've seen on the lecture quizzes, um, but there will be at least a couple of uh, short answer questions as well. Uh, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen with you now so we can take a look at uh, what's happening this week um, as it appears in Canvas in the modules. Let me get this out. 
So let me do it one more time just to make sure. There. So what you should be seeing on your screen right now is the modules page from Canvas. So here's that course materials module up at the top. And then if we scroll down, here was last week's module. And here's this week's module, week of May 31st. So here's our to-do list. Remember, it's really a good idea to check this to-do list on say Sundays. So you know what's coming up in the next week. Uh, first lecture exam is this week. Don't forget to watch the cell. Don't forget to get the quiz done by tomorrow night. And here's some information about the lecture exam in a little more detail. The exam is gonna open up to you on Canvas at seven. I think I had said eight earlier. I'm gonna open it up at seven, just in case anyone wants to take the exam before lab begins on Wednesday, that's perfectly fine. You'll have plenty of time to get the exam done if you choose to do that and um, get um, to lab with us. You can take it any time though during the day, as long as you submit it by 8 p.m. Now, if anybody has an issue getting it submitted by 8 p.m., um, please get in contact with me, message me through Canvas, um, and we'll see what we can do. Um, you are allowed to use your lecture notes during the exam. You're allowed to have them right with you during the exam, but you are not to use any other materials. And of course, you cannot receive any assistance from anyone during the exam. You have 90 minutes to complete it once you begin and you can only take it once. Um, as I told you last time, most students in this course are able to complete the exam within about 30 to 60 minutes. You won't know your final exam grade until I've gone through them. Remember, it's only out of 80 points, not 100 points. So that's the lecture exam information for Wednesday. Now regarding lab, today we're going to be doing an exercise called examination of living microbes. And on Wednesday, when we get together, we're gonna to be doing simple staining. And as usual, there will be lab homework this week that'll be due by Sunday at midnight. So when we have lecture exams, we still get together for lab. It's a little bit different when you have a lab practical exam schedule because of course, lectures and labs are separate in this class. So when you have a laboratory exam scheduled, we will not meet for laboratory that, that day. Um, so a little bit different between lecture and lab exams. All right. Now, I'm going to try to do this as well. I have a dog trying to get in my lap. <laughs> okay. So, does anybody have any questions about the lecture material that you've been viewing? Does anybody have any questions about um, the history of microbiology lecture, for example, or the microscopy? Uh, lecture information. Um, I did notice, here's the cell lecture. Um, so uh, asking about the cell lecture, um, it's up on YouTube in the playlist. Is that what you're asking? The cell lecture is up on YouTube. And um, in the modules, you'll find the slides for that lecture. Um, okay. Okay, sorry, I'm checking the chat. <laughs> oh, Valerie's asking a great question. Will the lab homework be graded before the lecture exam on Wednesday? It may be, 
it may be graded today actually because I have a block of time today that I may be able to devote to it. But here's the thing, Valerie and everybody, don't forget the lab material is not on the lecture exam. So the laboratory homework, anything that, that we talk about on the laboratory homeworks is not covered on the lecture exam, okay? So really it doesn't matter if I get them graded by Wednesday because you don't need to review lab materials for lecture, okay? I know it's, it's hard, but it really is, it's two courses in one. <laughs> so the lab homeworks, are definitely good to study when you prepare for your lab practical exam, okay? So for this lecture exam on Wednesday, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have good thorough notes for intro to the microbes, history of micro, and the cell. And you'll wanna review your quizzes. Um, if I ask a question on a quiz, that gives you an indication that that's an important thing to know, right, about the material. Yes, Lacey's asking about the pathway of light through a microscope. Yes, I'm happy to, to go through that. Um, in fact, you can see the microscope behind me on the counter the dust covers on it, but um, um, in my little home lab right now, um, I do have the microscope. Um, so remember that at the base of a microscope, there's gonna be some control to turn the light on. All microscopes get plugged into the wall to an electrical source, and they all have um, a bulb in them, some kind of a light bulb, an LED bulb or something. So when you turn that um, light switch on, you're gonna, the, there's gonna be light emitted at the bottom of the scope. That's gonna come up through the hole or the, um, the piece of glass that's in the base. So it always comes up from the bottom. Now that light is gonna travel straight up towards the stage. It's gonna hit the condenser and the diaphragm, which are together. Remember the diaphragm, you can adjust to determine how much, um, how wide of a beam you want on your specimen. The condenser, like it suggests, is gonna condense that beam and focus it directly on your specimen. Then it's gonna come up through a hole in the stage. So it's gonna come up and if you've got a, if you've got a slide on the stage, it's gonna go right through that slide, right through the material on the slide. Then it's gonna come up into the tube, sometimes called the body tube, sometimes called the binocular tube on the microscope. Oh, sorry, I forgot the objective lenses. It's gonna come up through the slide, through your specimen. It's gonna go through whatever objective lens that you have in place at that time. It's gonna go into that body tube, that binocular tube and it's gonna come up through the eyepieces. So from the base, condenser and diaphragm, or diaphragm and condenser, they're together through the stage, through the specimen, through the objective lens, up the tube to the eyepieces, to your eyes. And remember for compound scopes, we have multiple objective lenses to choose from, which is wonderful, especially when you're working with microbes. And since it's a uh, binocular scope, you always keep both eyes open. Sometimes that's really hard to do. <laughs> some, for some people, it's really awkward to keep both eyes open. But modern microscopes are fully adjustable with the eyepieces so you can bring them closer together or you can pull them farther apart, depending on how wide apart your eyes are. They're also independently focused. So if you're like me and you have a complex uh, prescription in your glasses, you can um, focus each eye separately on a modern microscope. And if you're like me and you wear glasses, glasses off when you use a microscope. 
modern microscopes are able to compensate for any visual problems that you may have regarding your ability to focus, which is wonderful. It makes them very, very helpful for a huge you know, variety of people. So good job. So somebody is asking about the lab homework, but it's coming up as iPad. So I'm going to try to figure out who's reading as iPad. Actually, it's mine. Oh, it is. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I open it from okay. iPad, so I don't know how it went with that name. So on the lab homework, give me just a second. I will pull it up. Lab homework for um, I'm, I'm talking about the quiz that we took for the lab. The last two question was confusing to me. Are you talking about the lab homework, Niana, or are you talking about the lecture quiz? Lab, uh, the biosafety lab. Biosafety? Quiz okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and pull that up for us. Hold on just a sec. Yeah. So question two on that homework talks about where um, PPE uh, and question, gloves? No, question nine and 10, the last two. Oh, the last two, okay. Yeah. Ah, question nine is what we call clinical application. Um, I'm gonna put a clinical application question on each one of your lab homeworks. These are tough questions. These are challenging questions. And they are related to some clinical aspect of microbiology. In other, word, in other words, something that is sort of a real world case or a real world question that you might deal with um, in your career in healthcare. Um, and this week's question uh, had two parts. Now, the first part said, that you are looking for microorganisms in a tissue sample from a lung biopsy that was obtained from a person who has pneumonia. So a, phys a person's uh, admitted to the hospital sick with pneumonia. And of course, pneumonia is a collection of fluid in the lung. It can be infectious. It can be non-infectious, but with infectious pneumonia, Again, typically we're talking about what bacteria or viruses. Remember, of all the different kinds of microbes, there are two kinds that cause most disease. The most common uh, pathogens in humans are bacterial pathogens and viral pathogens. So we've got a sick patient. For some reason, this patient's lung has been biopsied and um, it has been sent to the micro lab. So it's your job because you're in this, in this world, in this pretend world, you're working in the micro lab and you're looking under the microscope at this specimen or at a slide that was prepared from this specimen. Okay. Now you're looking under the scope and microbes first become visible under the 40X objective lens. Remember that's what we call the high dry lens. They can, those microbes can be seen in more detail when you go up to the oil immersion lens or the 100X lens. And you determine that you are most likely looking at bacterial cells. So the first question is, why is it unlikely that these are not archaeal cells? So again, clinical application because you already know some very important things about infectious disease in humans. In the, um, in the micro, uh, introduction to the microbes lecture, we talk about the domains of living things. We said that we can break all life on the planet into three groups, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. Why are archaea 
off our list. Well, Miss Lacey has it in the chat. Archaea don't cause disease in humans. Archaea have never been found to cause any problems in humans. Um, it doesn't mean that archaea are not found in our body. They are. Archaea are part of our microbiome. You can find archaea on us and in us, but they don't cause problems for us. They are not pathogens. So right away you would know, well, it's not an archaea. Now, sometimes when students are answering this question, and again, I haven't graded your work yet, so um, I don't know if anyone uh, described this, but sometimes what students will do in the answer is they'll tell me the difference between bacterial cells and archaeal cells. They'll tell me, for example, that archaea don't have a cell wall, that archaea have an S layer instead of a cell wall. You'll um, read more about that or watch more about that in the cell lecture. Um, that's true. Archaea and bacteria are different cells structurally, which is why they're in different domains. But, and again, this goes to clinical application. You're told that you examined this organism under the 40X lens and then the 100X lens. And you simply cannot see the cell wall with a light microscope. You would need an electron microscope to do that. Remember the electron microscope can show us the structures that are within a cell or on the surface of a cell. Depending on whether you use a scanning electron microscope, that's the surface or a transmission electron microscope, that's the interior. So you would have had to have picked up on that. You would have had to have picked up on, well, I can't tell a bacteria from an archaea with a light microscope. So there has to be some other reason that I would immediately know that it was not archaea. And the way you would immediately know that is because archaea are not pathogens for humans. They just don't cause any problems for us. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, now the second part of that question says, why is it not possible that these are viral particles that you're looking at? Remember we said the two big pathogens in people are bacteria and viruses. So how would I know, how would I guess that it's bacteria? We, we talked about the archaea, but how would I know it wasn't viruses? Connie's got it right. Connie's got it right in the chat. You know it's not a virus because you can't see a virus with an electron microscope. I'm sorry, with a light microscope. I have electron microscopes on the brain. You know it's not a virus because you're looking at it. You're looking at this thing. You can see a microbe. You saw it first at 40X, and then you saw it in a little better detail under the oil immersion lens. This is something we're going to touch on in today's lab exercise, this idea that we have to start getting comfortable with what we can see and what we cannot see under a microscope. We need to start getting comfortable with what we can see at 5X under a microscope what we can't see at 5X, what we can see at 40X, what we can see at 100X. So you will not see a virus under a light microscope. It's just not possible, they're too small. Remember in the um, intro lecture, one of the things that we talked about was this relative size between cells. Eukaryotic cells are the biggest, Plant cells are bigger than animal cells. Then we have prokaryotic cells. Those are the bacteria and the archaea. And then below them, we have the viral particles. Bacteria and archaea, those kinds of cells are in, are in the single micro, micrometer range. So not millimeter, micrometer. 
So bacteria are typically one or two or maybe three micrometers or micrometers long, very, very small. But viruses are about a thousand times smaller. They're so small, we can only see them with an electron microscope. So we're gonna know just by the fact that we can see this thing under the microscope, we can break down what we're looking at at least a little bit. It can't be archaea because archaea don't cause people to get sick. It's probably bacteria. Now, could it be a eukaryotic microbe? Sure. Sure, it could be. Remember, there are eukaryotic microbes. There are some single-celled microscopic eukaryotes like yeast, right? Certain kinds of algae or protozoa, but the most common pathogens in humans are bacteria and viruses. So your instinct should be, it's probably a bacterium I'm looking at. Good question. <laughs> Lacey's saying you could buy a used EM for just a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> so if you'd like to have one, you just need to put out a quarter of a million and you can get a nice one on, on eBay <laughs> or something. Yeah. Yeah. They're not, um, not an inexpensive device, an electron microscope. Um, but boy, are they wonderful. The things that you can see are just so wonderful. Um, I will try to remember to post some of my most favorite EM images um, for us to take a look at um, because they are, um, they're amazing. They're amazing what you can see. All right, so that was question nine. And then question 10 was about unit conversions. Now, what I'm going to do for everybody after I grade the lab homework is I'm going to post for us, um, either in an announcement or on one of the discussion boards, I'll, I'll let you know, I'm going to post the solution to that question, um, at least the way I was looking for you to answer it. We don't have the opportunity in this class to really talk about unit conversions. Um, the hope is that you've had some exposure to it in your previous uh, courses, in your previous education, that you've had some exposure to this concept of taking something that's in one type of unit and converting it into a quantity in another unit. Um, it is a skill that you should practice. And that's because most of you want to go into fields of healthcare where you will be dealing with things like dosages. So it's super important that you learn the concept and you get comfortable with it because trust me, um, we check and we double check and we triple check dosages and we check them for each other and nurses check over doctors and doctors check over nurses and dentists check over hygienists and so on and so on and veterinarians and their technicians check each other and research scientists and their technicians check each other. Math is really something that is very, very easy to make mistakes with. And as you can imagine, there are some things in healthcare you don't wanna make mathematical mistakes with. So, um, so we're always doing unit conversions because we're always figuring out how much somebody needs of some medication or some fluid or something else. So the application for us, those of us who are in healthcare or who want to become healthcare providers, the application of unit conversions for us is generally related to dosing, but you can apply unit conversion techniques to anything that you wanna convert from one thing to another thing, which is why we do this um, extra credit question on this homework. So I'm not gonna um, walk through it right now with you, but I am gonna post the solution for you so that you can take a look. Um, and I will tell you, I'm not going to put a unit conversion question on the exam 
because again, it's not something we spend time with in this class, but it was just an opportunity for you to try to practice it if you wanted to, because it was extra um, and see if you could figure it out. All right, very good. The only other thing I wanted to talk about with regards to questions, there was one uh, quiz question, lecture quiz question in the history, uh, history of microbiology topic about germ theory. And uh, enough of you um, had trouble with it that I wanted to um, talk about it just for a minute um, to make sure everybody was clear on this concept. So there was a question on the quiz about germ theory and what basically what germ theory teaches us about this concept of infection. So I think the question basically said, you know, is it is this statement true or false? And the statement was something like, you know, infection results from a pathogenic organism coming into your body. And if you answered true for that, you got it wrong because that was not a complete description of what germ theory tells us about infection. One of the key points of germ theory, one of the biggest things that we learned from germ theory, and remember we give Louis Pasteur credit for it, but a whole lot of scientists contributed to germ theory. The concept is this, it's not enough for a microbe to simply come into the body for that to lead to infection. Um, what has to happen is the microbe has to establish itself to the point where it can divide. It has to grow. And when we use that word grow in microbiology, we're really talking about division. It has to establish itself to where it can divide and make more of itself. So a pathogen that comes into your body will not necessarily establish infection. It has to divide. It has to get past your protective barriers and your immune system at least long enough to begin this process of cell division. And that's one of the big discoveries of germ theory. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because you and I are constantly exposed to pathogens. Pathogens go all over the place every day and we encounter them. We, they come in through our mouth, through our nose, sometimes through our eyes. They come in um, through our urinary tract. They can come in through our reproductive tract. Um, pathogens are everywhere and they do come into our body all the time. But, but you don't get an infection from those pathogens necessarily. Um, and the difference is that those pathogens, when you don't get sick, those pathogens have not started dividing. They've not started to increase in number. Um, they've not breached your protective barriers. They have not yet escaped, at least temporarily, your immune system and, um, and got into a place where they could start dividing. All right, very good. So yeah, um, if you can get the cell lecture viewed and your notes taken and the quiz finished early enough, I will go through them and um, give you comments on anything that you've missed before the exam on, um, on Wednesday. Now, if you don't hand your quiz in till midnight on Tuesday, obviously I won't have a chance to grade that before 7 a.m. But, but like I said, if you're able to get the quiz in a little bit earlier, I will keep a lookout. And if, any, if you get anything wrong on that, the cell quiz, um, I'll make some comments for you so you know um, what to do in terms of updating your notes. So yeah, the, the real, the best way to prepare for the lecture exam today and tomorrow is to make sure your notes are in order, to go through those three lectures once, once you've viewed them and make sure that your notes are in good order um, and you'll be all set to go. 
Yeah. So, so don't, don't stress over the exam. I know first exams are very stressful because you've, it's the first time you've taken one of my exams and it's just a little nerve wracking, but try not to stress. Um, I imagine most of you are going to do very well because you've done well on the quizzes. All right. All right. Very good. So I'm going to move now into our uh, exercise for the day, which is uh, examining living microbes. And that's what you should be seeing right now on your screen, the title slide, examination of living microbes. So I will always try to uh, give you a list of our goals for the day or our plans for the day at the beginning of our laboratory exercises. And this is our objective for this morning's exercise. In the first part of the lab, we're gonna talk about one of the features of a light microscope, which is uh, a compound light microscope, which is phase contrast. We'll talk about the usefulness of phase contrast with living microbes. We'll, we're gonna talk about wet mounts and why we would make wet mount slides. We're gonna talk about hanging drop slides and why we would make those. And we're gonna talk about the difference between true cellular motility that we can see under a microscope and a phenomenon that's called Brownian movement or Brownian motion. And then in the second part of the exercise, we're gonna do a wet mount. We're gonna make and examine a wet mount together. So let's talk first about examining living cells because that is a, a type of microscopy that is different from examining cells that have been stained. So we use a lot of staining in microbiology. In fact, we use a lot of staining in microscopy in general. The reason that we stain cells in order to look at them under a microscope is because it lets us see them better. It allows us to visualize the cells better, particularly using bright field and dark field, the bright field and dark field features on a light microscope. When you stain a cell, when you stain a living cell, you're gonna kill the cell, okay? you're actually killing it twice because one of the things we do when we make and stain slides is we heat fix the cells so that they stick to the slide. And we're gonna talk more about heat fixing in Wednesday's lab. So we, we take steps to heat up the cells so they will adhere to the slide and then we stain them so we can see them better. And these stains that we use are toxic. The stains kill as well. So heat fixing them to the slide is gonna kill them. And then staining them is gonna kill them again or make sure that they're dead. We're not doing the staining in order to kill the cells. It's just something that happens as a consequence of staining. Again, the reason that we stain is so we can better visualize the cells. And it just so happens that staining also kills living cells. Now, most of the time that doesn't cause us any problems. The fact that the cells are being killed doesn't cause us any problems. But there are times when we want to examine certain specimens and figure out whether or not the microbe is modal whether or not it's capable of moving under its own power. And in order to do that, you have to keep it alive. You have to have a living specimen. Now, a good, a good example of when you would want to keep cells alive while you're examining them is when you are looking at environmental samples. When you are receiving a sample that has been collected from the environment, and you wanna take a look to see if there are any mobile or motile 
microbes in that sample. Um, for example, here in New Hampshire, where we have lots of uh, recreational bodies of water, we have a lot, all kinds of lakes and ponds and rivers that people love to recreate in. Uh, we have monitoring programs in place that are monitoring the quality of the water to make sure that there aren't any dangerous collections of microbes in the water that might cause illness to um, a person who got into that water. Certainly the water that we drink is also monitored, at least if you're on a municipal water supply. If you're um, living somewhere where you're living, uh, you're getting your drinking water from a well, um, you have to take care of that monitoring yourself. You have to submit your own samples. But in New Hampshire, we have a state laboratory that's run by um, the Department of Environmental Services that keeps track of water quality for us. And people who have wells, people who keep uh, water tanks, water cisterns on their property, they can submit samples for evaluation. Um, it's done all the time. Um, on, in more industrial spaces or commercial spaces, samples are collected all the time from things like ventilation systems or humidification systems to make sure that there's not abnormal microbial growth. So probably the most common um, application of looking at living microbes is in environmental samples. So I said that one of our um, objectives for today is to talk a little bit about this feature in light microscopy called phase contrast. Um, what you're looking at on this slide up at the top on the left and the right are images that were taken using a light microscope that is set to the phase contrast um, setting. And you're looking at cells as they appear on slides underneath phase contrast. Phase contrast is very, very useful when we are looking at unstained living microbes. And that's because it allows us to see the three dimensionality of cells. It's sometimes hard for us to remember that cells are three dimensional. When we look at a stained preparation, when we look at cells on a slide that have been stained, it's very easy for your brain to start thinking that cells are two dimensional, but they're not, they're three dimensional and they have different structural features in three dimensions. So what phase contrast allows us to do is see a little bit more of that three dimensionality um, especially in, again in living microbes. Living cells can be hard to see under the microscope because they don't have any color. They're gonna fade in to the slide essentially. So you can see when you turn to phase contrast, you can see cells a little bit better. Notice how there's almost a little halo of brightness around these cells. That halo effect is very prominent in when you use phase contrast on the microscope. It allows for the, what we call refractive properties of cells and whatever surrounding liquid they're floating in to stand out as brightness. So remember light bends and um, depending on the lenses that we pass it through, it's going to bend and phase contrast just takes advantage of that. Now, one of the things you might notice on this image is that some of these cells are round or they look round and some of them look elongated. That again speaks to the three dimensionality of cells. All of these cells are identical in terms of what they are and yet they look like they're very different shapes because they're moving. And of course you can't see the movement um, with a snapshot like this, but 
The reason this cell looks elongated and this cell looks rounded is because you're looking at this cell end on, and you're looking at this cell from the side. So again, we always have to remember that cells are not um, two-dimensional, they're three-dimensional. Think about a loaf of bread. That's always my favorite example. A loaf of bread can look like a square if you're looking at it end on. And it can look like a rectangle if you're looking at it from the side. And cells are the same way. So you're going to see those kind of differences on a slide, on any slide that has cells on it. But it's especially apparent when you're watching them swim around <laughs> when they're alive and they're swimming around. Um, certain cells will swim up higher on the slide. Some cells will swim down lower on the slide. That's called the plane, the plane of focus, P-L-A-N-E. So it's a very different experience when you're looking at living microbes versus when you're looking at stained, um, adhered to the slide, dead microbes. Um, and it can be hard. It can be hard to view living things, which is why phase contrast is really helpful to us. All right. One of the things I do want to mention about working with environmental samples, especially water samples, is that they're very dilute, obviously. A lot of times when we collect water samples from the environment in order to examine them for microbes, we have to um, do something to collect the microbes together. And generally that means you're putting it into a centrifuge. So you take a sample that maybe is 500 mLs of water, maybe you collected it from a pond and you centrifuge that sample so that you gather all of the cells in one place. And that's what you're looking at on this slide. This is a view that is not under phase contrast. How do I know? Well, I don't see that grayish background, right? Here's the phase contrast background, very gray looking. Here's this background, very bright. So remember, bright field means that the background is bright, the objects are darker. Dark field means that the background is dark <laughs> and the objects are lighter. So this is a bright field view. And as you can see, there's all different shapes and sizes of little critters in here. Some of them are naturally colored. They have a uh, green and brown pigment. That's also very common in organisms that you collect from the environment. This is a sample that drives home the idea that cells have different shapes and sizes, right? Eukaryotic cells are big and that's what these are. These are eukaryotic organisms, these big green cells. Even the brown cells here are relatively big. These uh, zigzaggy looking cells, those are big multicellular eukaryotic organisms. All right, so this one over here in this image, basically the same idea. We've got a collection of organisms that we got from an environmental sample, very diluted environmental sample. So we had to centrifuge it to gather all the organisms together. This is a wet mount. This is a slide that the sample was simply placed onto and it was not stained. So all of these um, colors that you're seeing, these are natural colors. Here's an interesting little critter right here. Um, obviously this is not a microbe. It is microscopic, but it's not single celled. Remember, by our definition, a microbe is microscopic and single celled. We find microbes in all three domains, bacteria, archaea, and prokarya, uh, and eukarya. Now, the very smallest things that you can see on here, 
the very smallest little dots are those bacteria or those archaea? I don't know. The only thing I can tell you is they're not viruses because of course we can't see viruses with a light microscope. Now, this is uh, what's called a wet mount that was made with some bacteria. This first um, video I wanna show you was made with a type of bacteria called Enterobacter orogenes. I wrote the name down here in the notes section for you. We'll also look at a short video of an organism called Rhodobacter spheroides. Now take a look at these names. When we write out the scientific name for an organism, we write it in a very particular format. Remember, every living thing has a genus and a species. And we write those two names together generally. The genus name comes first. The genus name gets a capital letter. The species name comes second and it does not get a capital. Then we have to make a choice. We can either put both names in italics or we can keep it in regular type, but we need to underline each name separately. So genus names capitalized, species names are not. Both names either are put in italics or each name is individually underlined. Now we don't always have to write out the whole genus name. You don't always have to write out Enterobacter. You can take the first initial and then the species name. So you could also call this organism E. erogenes or R. spheroides. We'll have an opportunity in this course to look at lots and lots of different bacteria and we will look at their scientific name. Um, scientific names have a very peculiar format. And that's a format that we need to learn. Um, you are gonna be doing a couple of things for me where you're writing things down and I will expect you to write down the name of the organism correctly. And if you don't, I will gently remind you. Um, so Elaine is saying, I don't see the names. Hold on just a second, Elaine. Remember when we look at slides in here uh, um, in laboratory, there's a little notes section at the bottom underneath every PowerPoint slide. This is true of any PowerPoint slide you look at, all right? So sometimes I will put some notes down here for you. And it's because I'm talking and I'm not drawing on the board or something. So I want you to be able to see how something is written or I wanna give you a little extra piece of information and so on and so on, okay? Yeah, so I, I just couldn't see any of it on the view before. All I oh, could sure. see was the big blue screen, so. Sure, and it's very little, I know, from what you're viewing. So let's take a look at this. I'm actually gonna make this larger so we can see it a little bit easier. So this is a sample that was put onto a slide as a wet mount. And basically what that means is the sample was simply placed on the slide with a cover slip. All right, now this looks very blue, I know, but this is not stain. You'll see in a minute that these cells are alive. I'm gonna put them into motion in just a moment for us. But what you are, the reason you're seeing blue here is because someone has put a filter, a filter sort of a lens. It's not technically a lens. It's just made out of colored glass. You can add colored filters onto microscopes. And somebody has done that. So again, we can see the cells just a little bit more easily. So this is not stain on this view. This is simply a filter. Now you're looking at these little tiny things on this slide. And again, I'm gonna put them into motion for you. So see if you can see them moving around. See those little guys swimming there? All right, hold on, let me stop now. 
So this view right here is under a 40X objective lens. And remember, if we want to calculate the magnification, we would take the power of the lens, which is 40, and the power of the eyepiece, which is 10, and we would multiply them. So we're looking under a 400x or a 400 times total magnification because we're using the 40x objective lens. And as you can see, under the 40X lens, you can see things moving. You can see cells moving on this slide. You can't see them in very much detail at 40X, but you can see them. These are bacteria. Now notice that there are also some things on here that are bigger and that aren't moving. This is a wet mount. This is just a drop of sample that has a cover slip on it. And there's gonna be bits and pieces of debris on here, depending where this sample came from. So these things that are bigger and sort of misshapen, a little bit darker colored, this is just debris in the sample. The cells are much smaller. And as you can see, they're swimming. We've got living motile bacteria on this. Now, now everything's gotten a lot brighter, right? We have moved up to a higher lens. We've moved up to the 100X oil immersion lens. So now we're at a total magnification of a thousand, a thousand X or a thousand times. That's what that X means. Same organism, just at a higher magnification. The reason it suddenly looks much lighter, it doesn't look nearly as dark, is because this is a higher objective lens. When you um, go up in power from lens to lens to lens, it's gonna look brighter and brighter. So let's take a look at them now. Now we can see them in much more detail, can't we? We certainly cannot see the cell wall. We can't see inside. We can't see any um, DNA or any ribosomes or anything like that. If we wanted to do that, we would need an electron microscope. But we can certainly see these little cells swimming around. This is the rhodobacter sample. Again, under a filter on the microscope, look at these fellas swimming around. Notice that a lot of these are not swimming. A lot of these are just sort of sitting there. Some of them are clumped together. Not all of these cells are alive. That's normal too, especially in an environmental sample. We've got living cells, we've got dead cells, depending on where this came from. Um, that may be an important finding for us. Notice that when they swim, these cells move quickly. They tend to move in one direction. They tend to be forward moving, as we call it. If you try to force your eyes to look at one cell and follow it, it has forward moving motility. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily going in a straight line. It just means that it's generally moving forward, okay? That's important too, because we need to be able to distinguish this kind of movement, which is actual cellular motility from a different kind of movement that we're gonna call Brownian motion or Brownian movement, which is an artifact, it's not real. So those cells are moving. Those cells are moving. <laughs> and one of the things about prokaryotic microbes, so bacteria and archaea again, is that they sometimes have external, external appendages that help them move. And the primary appendage that is doing that is a flagella or flagell, I should say a flagellum, that's one or flagella, that's multiple. Those are the tail-like structures that we sometimes find on the outsides of these prokaryotic cells. 
eukaryotic cells can also have flagella. Eukaryotic cells also can have smaller, more multiple appendages called cilia. Those are the little hair-like ones. Anybody know? Type into chat for me if you do. What's the human cell, the human cell that has a flagellum? What's the name of that cell? Good. Sperm. Sperm cells. Sperm cells have flagella. Remember, that's the whole job of a sperm cell is to swim, 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 right? Get up through the female reproductive tract, find the egg, and fertilize it. And they put all of their energy into moving that flagellum so that they can get where they need to go. How about cilia? What, what are some eukaryotic cells, human cells, that are ciliated? Or if you don't know the cell name, um, the structure. Where do we find cilia in humans? Got some good ideas coming in. There's a couple places in the human body that have cilia, right? The respiratory tract, not all the way through it, but in parts of it, and generally the higher up parts have cilia. So you're not going to find cilia down in the alveoli, for example, of the lungs, but you will find cilia in the trachea, yeah, and into parts of the Bronco, um, the bronchi, they tend to start to go away as you get into the bronchioles and deeper down into the respiratory tract. Lacey's saying you need to have cilia in places where things need to be moved, like mucus. That's exactly right, Lacey. In a eukaryotic organism, a multicellular eukaryotic organism, like a human, the purpose of cilia is to move things away. So for example, in your trachea, the purpose of the cilia is to sweep particulate matter up out of your respiratory tract and into the back of your throat where you're gonna swallow it. You also have cilia in, if you're a, a female, you have cilia in your reproductive tract you have cilia in what's called your oviduct. Um, it used to be called uh, the fallopian tube. That term is kind of falling out of favor now in anatomy. So the oviduct, which is the tube that runs from the ovary to the uterus, also called sometimes the uterine tube, although oviduct is the more scientific term. That duct, that tube is full of cilia. And the job of the cilia, again, move something along, and that something is the egg. The cilia help roll that egg to the center of that tube where hopefully it's gonna meet a sperm cell and get fertilized. Yes, so cilia in a eukaryotic multicellular organism help move things along. Remember, there are single-celled eukaryotes. There are little organisms, for example, in pond water that are eukaryotic, but they're single-celled. They too can have cilia, but their cilia is for movement. A single-celled organism uses cilia to move. Now, prokaryotic cells don't have cilia. Prokaryotic cells like bacteria and archaea, they can also have little hairs, but they're not called cilia. They have what are called pili and fimbria. And we'll talk about those in that lecture, the cell. So they can have hairs like pili or fimbria, and they can have long tail structures called flagella. The difference is, you know, what the purpose of that, that little appendage is. Very good. All right, let's jump back in. All right.
Hold on just one sec. Okay. This is another um, bacterium I want you to look at. This is also a wet mount. So a drop of fluid was placed on a slide and a cover slip was put over it, no stain. These are living microbes. This is a particular kind of bacteria called Listeria. Listeria monocytogenes. Don't worry about that name. I just wanna show you how it moves because unlike the, the cells we just looked at, Listeria, which is a pathogen, Listeria has a very unusual form of motility. It's called tumbling motility. Look at how Listeria moves. Listeria doesn't just swim forward. It also rolls. It rolls in 360 degrees, 365 degrees. Sorry, 360 degrees. It literally rolls over as it goes forward. So it almost looks drunk when it moves. See that little cell there? That one's not even going forward. This guy and this guy. By the way, when you see these elongated looking cells, what you're looking at is two or sometimes three cells that are moving together. They have made a chain formation and they're moving together. The reason some of these cells look black and some of them look brightly colored is because they're in a different plane of focus. We are under phase contrast here. We've got a gray background. Some of them look darker, some of them look brighter because we're in phase and phase contrast is all about three dimensions. So any cell that is down towards the microscope slide is going to look different from a cell that is up toward the cover slip. Listeria has tumbling, tumbling motility. Just like a little circus, little circus uh, performer. And listeria causes some very serious uh, disease. All right, so what I wanna talk about now is, is how we make these slide preparations for examining living cells. And remember, there are two techniques. One is called a wet mount and one is called a hanging drop. Primarily for environmental samples, although you could certainly make a wet mount or a hanging drop with a patient sample like urine but it's just not done uh, very commonly. So a wet mount is used when you want to look for living things that may or may not be modal. The hanging drop, we would only use when we know we're looking at a modal organism. So let's say I have a sample and I'm not quite sure if I'm gonna find any motile cells, a wet mount would be a good choice. You're gonna see that a hanging drop is a little bit more tedious to make. So I would only make the hanging drop if I knew that I had a mobile organism in there and I wanted to examine it. Now for both of these techniques, because we're using samples that tend to come from the environment, it's really, really important that our samples are well mixed. So we're almost always gonna be using a, a tool called a vortexer to mix up our sample really well before we draw out a small amount of it. We're gonna use either a sterile pipette or what we call an inoculating loop. Again, sterile in order to draw out our sample. Now, why? I just told you that we're looking for bacteria. We're looking for living things. Why do I need to use a sterile tool? Why do I need to use something sterile to take my sample? Who cares if it's sterile? You don't want to contaminate it with other microbes. Exactly. Exactly. I don't want to put anything else in there. 
right? I don't want to put anything in there that wasn't in there. I'm trying to figure out what's in the sample. So I don't want to add anything accidentally. So always a sterile instrument to draw out a little bit to put on a slide, either a sterile uh, pipette or an inoculating loop. And we'll talk more about inoculating loops in a couple of minutes. Now, we're gonna take out a small volume of sample and we're gonna place a drop right in the middle third of a microscope slide. And we're gonna make sure that we label microscope slides. We talked about how important it is to label containers the last time we were together. You also need to label your slides. Most of the time in the micro lab, we're not making one slide, we're making multiple slides. So for example, if you were working in a diagnostic lab in a hospital, you might be doing um, 10 different urine samples that morning. And it's your job to look at this, what we call the sediment in the urine and see if there's any bacteria in there. So you're gonna make 10, edit, you're gonna make one slide for each sample. And it's very important that you label each slide because you don't wanna get them mixed up. So similar to the containers we talked about last time, you're gonna to wanna to make sure your name and your initials. So either your full name or your initials are on the slide. The date, just in case that slide gets saved because you want someone else to look at it. If you know the name of the microbe, you're gonna to wanna to put that down there. But if it's a patient sample or, or an, a sample that you're examining from the environment, you would wanna write that down. Say that, you know, this is a sample from Lake X or um, this is a sample from River Y. Um, it's very, very easy to get slides mixed up in the laboratory. And that's the last thing you would wanna do So we use a tool called a vortexer to mix up samples. If you've never handled one of these, they're great little devices. You can see this person is holding a plastic test tube. It's got some kind of liquid in it. When you press the tube into this little rubber cap, it will cause the, uh, a vibration pattern that will mix up this liquid very effectively and very quickly for you. Here are some transfer pipettes. We use these a lot in the laboratory. You can buy these sterile or you can buy them non-sterile, depending on your needs. They're very inexpensive. They are single use items. Now here the person is using a transfer pipette to draw up a sample that we're gonna assume has been well mixed. Notice that the person has their gloves on because in the micro lab, we're always wearing gloves. Notice too that they're drawing the sample from the middle of the container. Anytime you're working with a large volume in the micro lab and you need to draw up a sample, again, first get it well mixed. But then instead of drawing from the very surface or drawing from the very bottom, we generally draw right from the middle. Try to draw from that middle layer of fluid. Okay. The next thing is to put that uh, sample onto the slide. This person is putting one drop down right in the middle third of a microscope slide. Now this person does not have gloves on, so I'm gonna assume this is not a microbial sample. Um, it can be hard when you're first learning how to make things like wet mounts and hanging drops. It can be hard to find your sample underneath the microscope because again, there's no color here. There's no stain here. So when we're first learning, oftentimes we'll take a Sharpie pen and we'll draw a circle on the slide, right in the middle of the slide. That can help us find our sample when we go underneath the microscope. Now, 
what you're looking at over here is that microscope slide from the side. We're looking at a side view. Here's the droplet of fluid. And we're going to put a cover slip down. When we're making a wet mount, we put a cover slip on top. And rather than just dropping the cover slip down, we're going to do this. We're going to put one edge of the slip down, and then we're going to slowly lower the other edge. Now, the reason you do that is because if you simply drop a cover slip onto fluid, you're going to get a bunch of bubbles. You're going to get a bunch of air bubbles. It's not the end of the world to get air bubbles, certainly, but it can interfere with your ability to understand what you're looking at on the slide. So it's best to put the slide, the cover slip down very slowly, put one edge down, and then slowly drop the rest of it onto the liquid. So wet mount, very basic drop of fluid, center of the slide, cover slip, gently placed down. Now, wet mounts are very helpful, very easy to make, very quick, very, you know, very um, simple technique, but they are limited in a couple of ways. Here's the most important one. You have a very limited amount of time to examine a wet mount. The amount of fluid that is underneath that cover slip is very, very small. It works out to about 20 microliters in a drop of fluid. So underneath that cover slip is a very small volume and you're gonna examine it under a microscope that has light shining through it and that light is hot. So what happens is the water, the fluid, under the cover slip is gonna evaporate very quickly. Your sample is gonna dry up. You have 10 minutes maybe to look at a wet mount. So that's a real limitation, especially if you see something on your wet mount and you wanna show it to someone else. Maybe you wanna show it to a colleague or to a supervisor or to a physician. One of the ways we get around this time limit is we put a little bit of petroleum jelly, a little bit of Vaseline or something similar around the edge of the cover slip. And then we press it down over our sample. That Vaseline is gonna help hold the fluid a little bit longer. It's not gonna keep it for very long. It's gonna extend your time to hours instead of minutes. The other thing to remember when you're examining your wet mount is that the light that's in a microscope gets hot. So if you're examining your wet mount, you know, for 10 or 20 minutes, you gotta be careful. You have to move the slide around so that you don't cook those cells. You will, you'll cook the cells. If you leave them underneath the light for minutes and minutes and minutes on end, It'll get that hot for them underneath that light. So you wanna continually move the slide around, look at different areas underneath the cover slip so you're not heating up the cells too much. So you really have, you're really limited with a wet mount in terms of how long it's gonna last. One of the big benefits of making a stained slide is that once a slide is stained properly, it, it's, it's there, it's yours, you can keep it. So if you're looking at microbes and you wanna keep your stained slide, you can. That can go right into um, you know, a, a, a collection of samples for a patient. Wet mounts, no. Wet mounts, you've got a limited amount of time, generally minutes, maybe about 10 minutes to examine it. If you add a little bit of Vaseline under the edges of the cover slip around the, around the very outer edges, you would extend that maybe to a couple hours. But they are very helpful for examining living things. Now let's switch gears and talk about the hanging drop. Now remember I said, if I had a sample and I wasn't sure, whether or not there were any motile 
microbes in there, I would make a wet, I'd make a wet mount. It's quick, it's easy, and I can find out very quickly if I have any microbes that are moving around. If I know that I have a mobile organism that I'm dealing with and I want to examine it under the microscope, then I might switch over to a hanging drop. So motility can be seen under a cover slip on a wet mount. Yes, yes. What a hanging drop does for you is it gives you a preparation that is going to sort of concentrate the cells in one area and it's going to keep the cells in a more natural shape and arrangement. Now, what do I mean by that? Remember, when we looked at the listeria tumbling across that slide, some of the listeria were forming short little chains together. They were kind of joining together end to end. That's a very common behavior for microbial cells. They form these little arrangements in nature. They, they can form clumps, they can form chains. Sometimes they uh, get together in pairs. That arrangement is sometimes lost on a wet mount. And that's because we put a cover slip on and we sometimes disrupt the cells by doing that. A hanging drop allows for those natural arrangements to last a little longer. It, it, in other words, a hanging drop removes the compression effect of a cover slip. So what you're looking at on this slide is just um, uh, some sort of a branch of material that has been out in the rain and you can see these drops of water hanging down from the branch. This is what we're replicating with a hanging drop in the laboratory. Now it requires a different type of microscope slide. It's gonna require us to use what's called a depression slide. Like the name suggests, this glass slide has a depression cut out of it. it has a little concave area in the center. We're also gonna use a cover slip, but because of the depression in the slide, what'll happen is a drop will hang down from the cover slip into that well, if you will, or that concave area. So it's different from using a flat slide because it's gonna allow a drop to hang down into the depression from the cover slip. Now, this is what a depression slide looks like this little area right here, this is an area that has been literally carved out of the microscope, uh, microscope slide. So if you were to touch this with your finger or your thumb, it goes inward, it's concave, it's a well, it's a well of space. And what we're gonna do is suspend liquid from the cover slip, hanging off of the cover slip into that well. In this picture up on the top, you can see that from the side. So here's my glass slide. I'm looking at it from the side. Here's my cover slip. Notice that it has been raised up a little bit, again, with a little petroleum jelly. And there is a drop of fluid hanging off of the cover slip on the bottom. And that well or the depression in that slide is allowing that drop to form. It's not getting compressed. It's not getting flattened the way it would on a normal microscope slide. So we have to create these in a different way than we would create a regular wet mount. What we're gonna do is we're gonna place our sample not in the well. Remember, we don't want it to actually sit in the well. We want it to hang down into the space of the well. So you put your, your sample drop on the cover slip. You put some jelly, some petroleum jelly around the edge, and then you press the slide 
onto the cover slip. Flip it upside down and you're gonna have a drop of fluid hanging down off of that cover slip. Now, when you go to look at a hanging drop under the microscope, there's an important thing to remember. That drop is hanging. So it's got a, a lot of three dimensionality to it. We said that part of the reason we make a hanging drop is because we want to sort of gather all of the cells together in one place and we want to keep them in their natural arrangement. What's going to happen through gravity and through surface tension is that those cells are going to be drawn over to the edge of the drop. What you're looking at over here is just a drawing of a view underneath a, a hanging drop slide. So this area right here is nothing. This is just cover slip that has no fluid under it. This is the drop that's hanging. This is part of the drop. So I'm not gonna look at the drop right in the center of it. I'm gonna focus in on the edge of the drop because that's where the cells are gonna gather. That's what you're looking at over here. This is an actual view underneath the microscope. We're at 100X or a thousand times magnification. Over here, even though you see a lot of little dots, that's just, um, just an artifact of the slide and the cover slip. That might even be um, a little bit of the petroleum jelly. This is the sample. This is the drop over here, obviously greatly enlarged. We're only looking at a portion of the drop. Notice that we're focused on the one of the edges. We're looking at the edge of that drop because that's where these cells are gonna gather because of gravity, because of the pull of surface tension. They're gonna be drawn to the edge of the drop. Now I have another little video for you that I wanna show you. This is a person who's making, again, multiple slides at the same time, very common in the lab. They're gonna make multiple hanging drop slides in order to examine them. Now this person is working under a hood. Again, not a chemical fume hood, but a biological hood. So this person is trying to prevent any contamination from falling down on these slides while they're being made. Now, part of the reason I chose this short little video is because it's a nice demonstration of making a hanging drop. But another reason I chose it is because there's some things in here that we already know we shouldn't be doing. So number one, no gloves. This person is not wearing any gloves. That's a no, no. That person is holding a tube that has culture in it. It's got some broth in it that has microbes growing. Um, this you could also imagine might be a sample that came into the lab, again, maybe from an environmental sampling. But this happens to be a culture tube that the person purposefully grew bacteria in and is now going to examine them. So this person ought to have gloves on. This tool that the person is using, this is an inoculating loop. So there's a metal handle here, and then you cannot see it, but there's a wire coming out of there, and it's got a loop at the end, an open loop. And when you put that loop down into the fluid, it's gonna pick up a small volume of fluid. It's very similar. I use the analogy of little kids who play with uh, bubbles, who blow bubbles. You know, the little wand that you get with your bubble solution? Your wand has a little circle at the end, an open circle. And when you dip it into the bubble solution, you're gonna get a, a collection of bubble solution in the circle. The same is true of an inoculating loop. When you put it down into the culture fluid, or the sample fluid, that loop is gonna fill up with fluid. Just enough, just enough to make a drop, a hanging drop in this case. 
So let's take a look at this video. We'll see if you can figure out um, what, when you look here, what else is missing? What else have we talked about today that this person has not done? They're not wearing gloves and there's something else they haven't done. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So let me make this a little bit bigger for us. So they're gonna place a, a loop full of broth onto the cover slip. Remember, we're not placing it onto the slide here. We're placing it onto the cover slip. It's a tiny amount of fluid, tiny, tiny amount of fluid. Now, the person is also sterilizing that loop after they use it to get rid of the cells. Here comes the petroleum jelly. This person is not putting it on the cover slip. They're putting it on the slide. That's fine. Now, remember, these are depression slides. And the thing about depression slides is they cost more than a regular microscope slide does. And they are not single use. We keep them. We keep them, we wash them, we sterilize them, we use them again. So the slide gets picked up, pressed down onto the cover slip, flipped over. Pressed down onto the cover slip, flipped over. And if you've done it correctly, you're gonna get a drop of fluid hanging down off of the cover slip into the well. And we're going to focus right on the edge of the drop, not the center of the drop, but the edge. Now, this is a very hard video here to see anything, so don't feel bad if you can't. Um, it's very quick. Person's going to a, um, another lens. Again, looking for the edge of the drop because that's where the cells are going to gather. Very hard to see here, but you can see a little bit of movement. A little bit of movement over here. That's the edge of the drop. See the cells swimming around in there? They're just drawn over here. They can't help it. All right. Any idea what this person forgot to do? Connie, that's, a, that's an interesting point too. The, the person making these slides has rings on. Um, and generally it's not a no-no in the lab to wear rings, but um, it is a pain to wear rings. It is a pain because it's hard to get your gloves on and off with rings. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's not something that um, is considered improper hygiene in the lab, but um, it would be a consideration. It would be a consideration. You generally don't want to have rings on your hands. Um, the other thing that he, this person did not do, Lacey has it, is uh, it, there's no labels on the slides. There's no labels on the slides. Now, I don't know, maybe this, maybe this little video was made only for educational purposes, and maybe that's why the slides weren't labeled. But, um, but maybe if, if you were making an educational video, that, that would make it extra important that you label the slides. So yeah, those slides should have had a label on them. Um, we put our label right at the end of the slide, way far away from where our sample is going to be. And remember, we use these well slides, as they're sometimes called, or depression slides. So both of those names mean the same thing, depression slide or well slide, has a well cut into it. Um, because they're they're expensive, they're a few dollars a piece. So we save them and we reuse them. That's why some of those slides had like a white ring around them. That was from an old application of you know some kind of petroleum jelly or something. Um, you take those slides, you wash them, you sterilize them, and they're ready to go again. All right. I do want to say just one, uh, a couple of words about Brownian motion or Brownian movement. 
Now, if you remember from your chemistry class or perhaps your physics class, if you took physics, all things in the universe are in motion, right? Even the molecules in your desk or your chair or your pencil are in motion, um, unless you get down to absolute zero, uh, molecules vibrate, they move. Um, the movement that is associated with just plain old molecules um, in a liquid will cause them sometimes to strike cells. And the cell will then suffer the effects of that. The cell will then bounce or shake or vibrate because little molecules in the liquid are bumping into it. All right, now this is not motility. Motility is a phenomenon where the cell is moving itself. So if something bumps into the cell and causes it to move, that's not motility. And again, one of the best ways to distinguish true motility is to look for that forward motion. That Brownian motion is especially problematic <laughs> to view when you're under high power. When you're first learning and you're first looking at cells under a microscope, it's easy to think you've got motility when it's actually Brownian motion. What you wanna look for is to see if the thing is really moving forward with forward motion, or if it's just kind of vibrating or shaking in place. So on this slide, we're looking at a sample underneath uh, the microscope. Um, I believe we're at about 40X here. I'm gonna make this bigger for us. This is a wet mount. Nothing has color here. You notice this movement here? This is actually uh, essentially a current. It's a current through the liquid. So this is not motility. This is not even brownie in motion. The fluid is moving on the slide. I'm under 40X. How do I know? How do I know that this is just the fluid flowing underneath the cover slip? Well, look, everything is moving at the same speed, in the same direction. There's a little current in the fluid. And it probably means that the slide just needs a moment to settle. When you put fluid underneath a cover slip, especially if you put a little too much fluid, sometimes that fluid is just gonna move and carry things with it. All right, now how do I know that's not motility? Everything is moving at the exact same speed in the exact same direction. Living cells don't do that. Living cells go in all different directions like we saw earlier. So that's just a, sort of a flow of current across the slide. This one is more of a Brownian. This is much more characteristic of Brownian. Now, before I start the video, there are some cells. There's a cell right here. There's a cell right here. Now, these are big cells. These are yeast cells. There's one here that's a little harder to see. There's one here. There's also some strands of just debris on this slide. We're under a relatively low power here. We're under 40X. So yes, these cells look huge because they are eukaryotic cells. They are fungi. Now watch when I put, the, when I put this video in motion. If you were to look at these cells, right here. See how they're moving? That's not real. That's not real. That's not motility. The cells are not moving themselves. This guy right here, this cell right here, he's not moving himself. He's being pushed. He's being bumped into. Watch this guy, especially in the corner. Looks like he's going forward, doesn't it? but he's not really, he's sort of shaking and vibrating. This is Brownian. Let me take that back a little bit further. 
what you're seeing in terms of movement here is a shaking, a vibrating. It's not a purposeful forward movement. That's Brownian motion or Brownian movement. Here's another one. Again, a lot of material on the slide. You could see where you might be fooled and you might think, oh, this thing is moving. It's not. It's getting bumped into by all of the materials that are in that fluid. It's just getting bumped into and it's being moved forward. This thing right here, that's Brownian movement, okay? So it's not something that we're gonna focus on or anything. Um, I just wanted to show it to you because again, when you're first learning um, about how to recognize motility, that's something that can sometimes really frustrate students because they'll say, I see something moving. You do, you do see something moving, but it's not moving under its own power. Um, good question, Connie. The reason it's called Brownie, yes, it was named after someone. It was named after the scientist who first described it in the literature um, very early on in microscopy times. Um, you can always tell when something is named after a scientist because it gets a capital letter in the name. Yeah. All right. All right, let me pull up this next one here. Remember, if you've got true motility, these, these organisms are independent of one another and they're gonna swim at their own pace, in their own direction, in their own way. They're not all moving together. They're not all going in the same direction. They're not all moving at the same speed. You've got movement in all different directions. You've got movement in different at different speeds, okay? This is motility. This is true motility. All right. Any questions? Any other questions from what we've seen so far? In the time that's left to us today, um, we're gonna do our little uh, exercise together. We're gonna make a wet mount together, okay? So in order for me to get some um, living cells for us to look at, um, I actually made um, a very simple preparation um, with, without a pathogen or anything. Um, I actually made a very simple preparation, which always works by the way, I took a strawberry that I bought at the grocery store and I mashed it up in a little bit of water, a little bit of tap water. And I put it into um, a bowl and I left it. I left it for a few hours. And then I took the liquid portion and I put it into a test tube so I could use it for our experiment. Um, this is a way to take a look at yeast. If you ever wanna look at some yeast, <laughs> get a strawberry from the grocery store and mash it up in some water. Now, it doesn't mean that that strawberry was dirty and gross and contaminated. It means it's a living thing. It came from outside. And like all living things, the strawberry has microbes living on it. The strawberry has organisms on it too, just like you do. And it just so happens that because strawberries are grown very close to the ground, very close to the soil, um, it's very common for them to pick up fungal cells on them. Now, if I had popped that strawberry right into my mouth from the, from the container and it had uh, fungal cells on it, it wouldn't have hurt me. Remember, remember the vast majority of microbes are not harmful to us. They are not pathogenic. And what lives on the surface of a strawberry is not a problem. So even though we, we do like to wash our fruits and vegetables to try to make sure if there are any pathogens, we get them off. Um, strawberries are always good for, for some yeast cells. So 
So this is my hand that you're looking at here that's gloved. And here's just a little plastic disposable test tube, something we use very commonly in the micro lab. And you can see it's got this reddish liquid in it. This is just the fluid that I pulled off of that bowl with the mashed strawberry in it. Now, I wanna take a sample out of here. I wanna draw a sample out of this and I wanna make a wet mount. So we're gonna put into practice a couple of things that we've talked about so far. Remember gloves, always gloves in the micro lab. I don't want to contaminate myself with whatever is in this, the test tube and I don't wanna contaminate what's in the test tube with myself. Now remember microbes don't fly, they fall. So anytime that I'm gonna open up a test tube that has material in it that I need to examine, I'm gonna tilt it. I'm gonna take that tube and I'm gonna hold it at an angle. It's much less likely that something that might be swirling in a current of air is gonna fall into this tube if I hold it at an angle. The other thing I want you to notice is that I've taken the cap off, but I'm holding the cap in my gloved hand. I've tucked it between my fingers. You don't want to take a cap and place it down on your desktop. Remember, we assume that surfaces are contaminated, even if we have just disinfected them. If I took this cap off of the tube and I placed it down on the desktop, there's a decent chance I'm gonna get the, the cap contaminated. So always keep caps in your hand. Always tuck them in between your gloved fingers as you're working with the tube. I have a labeled microscope slide here. I have a transfer pipette, a sterile transfer pipette, and I'm placing a drop of my strawberry fluid right in the center of this slide. Now I'll tell you, this is a big drop. This is too big of a drop, frankly, for, um, for a microscope slide, but I wanted to make sure that we could see the drop. If you ever put too much liquid onto a slide that you're preparing, it is possible to draw a little bit of that liquid up. You can take um, a Kim wipe. That's one of these little pieces of um, uh, disposable paper that we use in the laboratory. You can fold it up and you can touch it just to the edge of the liquid and it will draw up the excess liquid by capillary action. If you ever get in a bind and you've got too much liquid on the slide, you can always draw a little of it off with a Kim wipe. Now I'm putting the cover slip on and it's a little bit hard to see from this angle, but I have touched one edge of the cover slip to the slide and I've allowed it to touch that drop of strawberry fluid. And look what happens. The fluid is going to be drawn all along the edge of the cover slip. You see that? Now I can gently put the rest of the cover slip down and I'm going to get fewer air bubbles on my sample. Now my slide has been prepared. I'm ready to examine my slide. So gloves off. Remember, don't touch anything in the laboratory that doesn't get routinely disinfected with a gloved hand. If you're going to use the microscope, gloves come off. Okay. All right. Before we take a look, does anybody have any questions? Oh, Lacey's asking, should I have gloves on when I'm putting the slide on the stage? As soon as the slide is made, Lacey, gloves off. While you are making the slide, gloves on. But as soon as that cover slip is dropped, now you're done. So gloves come off, you pick up the slide by the edges, you take it over to the stage and you put it into the clips that are on each side of the stage and you're ready to go.
So let's take a look. Now I said a couple minutes ago that sometimes it's helpful when you're first learning, especially when you're making a wet mount because the cells don't have stain applied to them so they're harder to see. Sometimes what you do to help yourself is you draw a circle on the slide with a Sharpie pen and then you put your sample in the middle of the circle. Well, this is what that looks like. When you put the sample, when you put the slide under the microscope, this is the Sharpie pen line. See how big it looks? See how easy it is to find? So even if you're not very good at focusing the microscope yet, you can always find your sample because you can find that big thick black line. And then all you have to do is look in the area that's in the center of that um, Sharpie circle on the slide. So what you're looking at now is the strawberry fluid at low power, all right? So remember, we always focus the scope first at low power and that's what you're looking at here. Now you can see a couple things. You can see something brown in the background and you can see this blue string right here. I didn't do this on purpose, but I'm glad it happened. This blue string is just a piece of debris. It could be a fiber from, um, gosh, who knows? It could be a fiber from clothing. It could be a fiber from some kind of plastic material, but it's, it's, it's just a piece of debris on that slide. It's nothing that I need to be concerned about. It's nothing um, for me to focus on. What I'm going to be focused on are, is this brown material. Now, remember, when we looked at that fluid with our eyes, we saw that it had a pink color, right? It has strawberry pink color. Notice that that color goes away under the microscope. All right, this is a wet mount. So any color that I'm going to see is going to be only if the organism has natural color associated with it. So I'm gonna take from 4X, once I'm in focus, I can sit back and I can rotate the next objective lens into place. And depending on your microscope, that might be a 10X lens or a 20X lens. I should be able to look through and it should still be in focus. Because remember, modern microscopes are par focal. So we only have to focus it fully one time under low power. And then we can move to the next lens and the next lens. And we, we should only have to make very minor adjustments with the fine focus knob. So now we're all the way up underneath the oil immersion lens, the 100X lens. So we're at a thousand times magnification. And guess what we have? We have some fungus. <laughs> now there's two forms of fungus visible here. And we're gonna talk about fungus in a couple of weeks. But for right now, know that what you're looking at here is yeast. That's a yeast cell. Here's another one. There's a couple more back here that are out of focus. They're in a different plane on the slide. And then you can see all these branches right here, okay? This is mold. This is the form of fungus that we call mold. And this is the form of fungus we call yeast. And many species of fungus, and again, we'll talk about this more when we talk about fungus in lab, but many species of fungus will take on both forms. They'll, they can exist as both mold and as yeast. The yeast actually emerges off of the branches. These branches get a name. We actually call these hyphae, hyphae or branching structures. So look, the yeast emerges off the end of the branch. And then once you have one yeast cell, it makes more. Yeast um, can reproduce asexually. So this littler circle that you see here is a little bud, a new cell that is emerging off of this one. 
this is simply a different view. All I've done is I've moved the stage slightly. So we're looking at a different view. I wanted you to see this. Here's a hyphae, a branch. Now notice, and I know it's hard to see, so I'll try to make it a little bit bigger for us. Notice this right here, this little circular or oval area inside the branch. And then there's another one right here. The branched parts, this mold here, this is multicellular. So this thing right here, this tree branch looking structure, this mold, this is not a microbe. The branching parts, this is not a microbe. Why? Because it's multicellular. How do I know it's multicellular? Because here's a nucleus and here's another nucleus. And there's another one over here, but it's out of focus. Again, we'll talk about this more in a couple of weeks, but it turns out that mold can be, uh, or sh I should say is multicellular. It's a form of fungus that's microscopic, but it's multicellular. So we would not call that a microbe. Yeast is different. Yeast is microscopic and single celled. So that's a true microbe. Notice that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine yeast cells. They're budding. The yeast is growing. This cell right here, the original cell divided, or I should say budded, and made this one, and then this one made this one, and this one made this one. They're just growing. Eventually, what will happen is these will break off, and they'll become individual yeast cells. But while they're growing, they form these chains. Kind of cool, kind of neat looking if you're a nerd like me. Here is another view. Notice that I'm off to the edge because this is the edge of the viewing field. Again, you can see these branches and then you can see these yeast cells. Here's a single one. Here's two or three. These branches can get very long before the individual yeast cells start to break off. They can get very long while the yeast cells are dividing. Now take a look at this view. I moved to a different field. I'm at 4x. 4x. Now if you were to look at this and you did not know what magnification that I was at and you saw this, you might say, oh, look, a spirochete. Or maybe it's a spirillum. Or this guy, maybe this guy's a spirillum. Spirillum, remember, sometimes have fewer bends and twists in them. Oh, look, maybe this is a spirillum. Nope, nope, can't possibly be. And the reason it can't possibly be is because we're at 4x. Bacteria can be seen at 40x, but they're not seen in very good detail unless you're at 100x. Let me say that again, because that's super important. Bacteria can be seen under the 40x lens, the high dry lens, but we generally examine them under the 100X lens because we're going to see them better. You are not going to see bacteria under 4X. They're too small. So what is it? What is that thing under 4X that looks like a spirochete? It's just a piece of the mold. It's just a piece of that branched mold fungus structure. A little piece broke off, several pieces broke off. That's not uncommon. Let me show it to you again. This is just pieces of the branching mold structure. Now take a look here. See that circular or oval structure? And here, and here, those are yeast cells. They look tiny at 4X, 
they don't look like what they what we saw at 100x but these are the yeast cells you will see yeast cells at 4x because yeast are eukaryotes yeast which is a form of fungus is a eukaryotic organism and remember our scale eukaryotic cells are big maybe a hundred times bigger than bacterial cells and always remember plant cells are bigger than animal cells so if it's a fungus if it's a eukaryote sure i can see that at 4x but i won't see bacteria at 4x I have to be at least at 40x to see bacteria. So if you ever get in a bind, if you're ever looking under 4x and you're saying, huh, I wonder if that's a bacterial cell. It's not, it's not. And when you get up to 40x or 100x where you can see bacteria, those yeast cells are gonna be huge like the ones we saw budding off of the end of the branches. They're going to be huge compared to the bacteria. So one of the things we'll practice this semester is thinking about what magnification we're at, because that can tell us quite a bit about what we might be looking at. Elaine's asking about um, how I made the strawberry mash. Like, how long do you have to leave it? Believe it or not, Elaine, you can get yeast off a strawberry. You can get enough yeast to see under the microscope in a few hours. Um, if you put the bowl with the mashed up strawberry, if you put it into a nice warm place, you can get it within, uh, say, three, four hours. I generally leave them overnight, though. So I mash up the strawberry with a little water. I'll cover it gently with, um, you know, a, a piece of something, and then I'll come back the next day and I'll draw the fluid off because then I know I'm going to get a lot of yeast growing. <laughs> That's right, Elaine. You you leave it as long as you can stand it. Right? It would actually be kind of fun to check it, you know, one hour later, two hours later and see, see how long it takes for a decent amount of um, fungus to start growing. It always grosses people out when I tell them, oh yeah, well, I can always grow some fungus from a strawberry and people will say, ew, gross, you know? And I'm like, no, no, no. It's a natural thing, a strawberry. It should have microbes on it um, because it's alive or it, it came from a living plant. And yes, I do recommend we wash our fruits and vegetables, but you will never wash everything off because strawberries have a microbiome. Just like you cannot wash your microbiome off, strawberries, you know, they have their microbiome too. Yes, Connie, grapes as well, right? Grapes are covered in yeast. And that's why we can make wine so easily. You know, if you mash up grapes and you put them into containers, they're gonna ferment because there's yeast all over grapes. You don't have to add yeast. The yeast are already there. They're naturally there. Same thing when you make uh, things, uh, pickles and sauerkraut and things like that. The organisms that are doing the fermenting for us are already on the vegetable or the fruit. All right. All right, let me see if I can get to our next picture here. What you're looking at here is a wet mount. Again, there's a filter on this image, which is why it's blue. There are bacteria visible here. We're under about 40X here, but that's not what I want you to look at. I want you to look at these. Anytime you see um, an almost perfect, uh, perfect circular structure on a wet mount like this, under a cover slip, in other words, it's got a nice thick black ring around it. It's white in the center. 
notice that you can still see through it. You're still looking at whatever's on this slide. It's just that it's not blue. It's white. That's an air bubble. These are air bubbles. Air bubbles tend to be perfectly circular. They tend to have a thick black ring around them. And if you have any color, either from a stain or from a filter, the color will not be in the bubble. All right, those that's what you're looking at there. And part of the reason that we handle our cover slips the way we do is because we want to avoid air bubbles as much as possible. So on this slide, what you're looking at, and we're under, um, we're not under 5x anymore, we're under 10x, so slightly higher magnification. The reason that it's blue here is not from a filter. All I did was I took a drop of stain. I didn't stain the cells specifically. What I did was I added a drop of stain to my wet mount. All I had to do was put a drop of stain next to the cover slip. So the wet mount I had already made, I put a drop of stain next to the cover slip and the stain will get pulled under by capillary action. It'll get sucked underneath the cover slip. Now, it's not the same as staining cells because it's a very dilute form of stain. Remember, the wet mount has a lot of fluid under the cover slip. By adding a little color though, I can see things a little bit better in a little more detail. So this would still be considered a wet mount, but I've, uh, I've made a wet mount with a drop of stain added to it. And the reason I did it is because you really get a different view, don't you? It's the exact same strawberry sample just like the one we saw before, just like the one that looked more like this, right? You can see these yeast, you can see them, you can see the branches, the hyphae here, no trouble. But boy, oh boy, when you add stain in, you get a very different view. This is 4X, look how little it looks here. This is 4X, now I'm gonna go up to 10X and look at, Look at how different it appears. What stain does for us, even if it's just a drop of stain added to a wet mount, is it gives us all kinds of detail. It gives us all kinds of detail. It just makes things look different. It helps us see things a little bit differently underneath the microscope. So, The next time we get together, we're going to start talking about staining. We're going to start talking about probably the, the most basic type of staining, which is called simple staining. And what we'll do together is we'll make a heat fixed bacterial smear, as it's called. We're going to put some bacterial cells on a slide. We're going to heat fix them. We're going to stain them. And we're going to take a look. And we'll be able to see some of the different um, shapes that bacterial cells take um, underneath the microscope. That'll be on Wednesday when we get together. I apologize, I've kept you over. I try not to do that. Um, but that's all I have for you today. Remember, you're gonna wanna get the cell lecture viewed as soon as you have the opportunity. And you'll want to get that lecture quiz done as soon as you have the opportunity so that you can get your notes in shape so you're all set for the lecture exam on Wednesday. Remember, I will open it up at 7. You don't have to take it at 7. <laughs> but if you have work obligations later in the day and you just want to get it done, you'll be able to do that before the lab starts. Okay? Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? All right, very good. Send me a message if you have any questions about anything that comes up.
And otherwise, I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.